I now have the privilege of interest, introducing Dr. Christian Kohlmansberger, one of the medical professionals who wants us to make sure that we let Ontario know how well BC did. Uh, Christian is a staff medical oncologist at the BC Cancer Agency, uh, Vancouver Cancer Centre, and has been there since February of 2004. His research is focused on genitourinary malignancies with a special interest in testicular and renal cell cancer. Dr. Kohlmansberger also uh, serves on our medical advisory board for KCC, so he's another tremendous gift to our organization. Uh, Dr. Kohlmansberger is going to speak to us about current medical treatments for kidney cancer. Thanks, Catherine. First, I would like to thank everybody of you to be here. Um, it's fantastic to see that great turnout. Um, I also would like to uh, thank KCC on our behalf and on your behalf because um, you may not be aware, but KCC, uh, ever since it was um, founded, has been a tremendous advocate for you uh, in order to make sure that we get access to all these new drugs and all these new treatments. And it has really put kidney cancer on the front page uh, so that, uh, that uh, you and, and have an advocate um, which speaks on your behalf uh, in, in, to make sure that uh, all those great developments we have in kidney cancer really get, ac uh, you, so that you can get access to that. So what I would like to do today is I would like to give a brief overview over what we currently do and how we currently treat kidney cancer. Um, and also maybe introduce you a little bit on what, what the doctors are thinking when they make decisions about your treatment. So kidney cancer um, is uh, not one of the big cancer types in Canada. We see about 5,000 uh, patients a year. And when you look at the distribution between the provinces, you see that in BC um, um, we have a fairly low incidence compared to other provinces. Uh, the most common, the, the, the highest uh, incidence of kidney cancer we see in Newfoundland uh, and uh, in the eastern provinces. If we talk about kidney cancer treatment, one way to treat kidney cancer is simply to prevent it. And the easiest way to prevent it is if we all stop smoking. Smoking is the biggest risk factor these days for kidney cancer, and about 30 to 40 percent of kidney cancer cases are attributed to smoking. Other uh, risk factors are occupational exposure. That has really diminished over the last um, 50 years with all the workplace safety measures we have. Um, obesity is under discussion whether that can increase the risk for kidney cancer. And then there is a number of genetic, uh, uh, genetic uh, syndromes which are associated with kidney cancer. The talk today, or everything I say, will apply to the most common subtype of kidney cancer. And I think you've heard this this morning that there are different types of kidney cancer. And what we, the treatments we, we talk about today will be all directed to the clear cell carcinoma subtype. The other subtypes are similarly treated, but there are some uh, profound differences. And all I'm going to say today applies to the clear cell type. And I will not talk about the localized stages because Dr. Black and Dr. So, uh, the uro-oncologists, uh, have already or will address that. We will talk about stage four kidney cancer, so that stage where the tumor has metastasized uh, to other parts of the body. So what treatments do we have? The treatment we usually, uh, we usually use is really, depend, for the most part, depending on the stage of the cancer. We have surgery, we have targeted therapies, and that is something which we will talk most in my talk. We have immunotherapy, which was used in the past and is almost not anymore used now. We can use radiation therapy, we can use classic chemotherapy, we can use active observation, and that may immediately sound counterintuitive, but, um, but it is something which we occasionally use even uh, if patients have metastasized. And of course, we use usually multiple combinations of these, of these different treatments. So when we talk about um, metastatic kidney cancer, um, 
the usual um, impetus is that to take one of those nodules out or the kidney out may not be really beneficial. Uh, and that is the case in a lot of the other cancers we treat. But in kidney cancer, it has been shown that even in the presence of metastasis, the removal of the primary tumor uh, may still make sense. And even the removal of solitary metastasis may make sense. So you may be confronted with a situation where the oncologist and or the surgeon recommend to take certain uh, parts of your tumor out. I mentioned observation, and that is something which uh, uh, patients sometimes have a hard time to, to understand why your oncologist recommends observation. But kidney cancer is a disease which has a very variable biology, and what I mean with that is that there are patients where the tumor grows very quickly, and then there are patients where the tumor grows very slowly. And we don't know why that is so. But if a patient has no symptoms from the kidney cancer and the kidney cancer grows very slowly, then just watching a patient may be a valuable option because whenever you institute treatment, treatment is associated with side effect and may affect your quality of life. Radiation therapy is something which we um, increasingly use because uh, even in radiation therapy there is an, a, a lot new in terms of new techniques um, which makes it uh, for certain, certain situations, uh, a very good treatment options. We use it particularly in bone metastasis or in brain metastasis. And then in chemotherapy or systemic therapy, the targeted agents, which is really the mainstay of our treatment. And as you can see here, um, there has been an uh, exciting development over the last eight to 10 years. Before 2005, there was really not much in terms of treatment for kidney cancer. All we had back then was so-called immunotherapy with in, uh, drugs called interleukin and interferon. Those were drugs where, which were very toxic, lots of side effects, did not really help a lot, and if at all, helped a very small group of patients. And since 2005, as you can see here, there have been five um, <clears throat> new drugs being approved in Canada, and they are funded, for the treatment of kidney cancer. There are two more which are currently in the approval process, and there, as you will see in this talk and the subsequent talk, there is a lot of other drugs which are coming down uh, the development pipeline right now. So what are targeted therapies? These are the chemotherapy we use for kidney cancer. They are called targeted therapies because they target a specific mechanism uh, in or outside the tumor which are important for the tumor to survive, to grow, and to metastasize. So in contrast to classic chemotherapy, which is a very uh, a big hammer, which is very unspecific, um, the targeted therapies are directed towards a very specific feature in the tumor. And for kidney cancer, we have two targets which we target. The first is the formation of new blood vessels. Kidney cancer is a tumor which relies in its growth very much on the formation of new blood vessels. And those drugs, and that process is called angiogenesis. And if we do something about it, that's called anti-angiogenesis. And those are the drugs which we use most uh, to treat um, kidney cancer. And then we have a class of drugs which are called mTOR inhibitors. mTOR is a, is a protein in your cell which is responsible for the control of a lot of different mechanisms in the cell. And amongst those, is angiogenesis, but also uh, uh, it is also involved in the regulation of uh, nutrition of the cell and a number of other things which makes it an, uh, an interesting target for us to shut down in order to shut the tumor cell down. <clears throat> for a long time, these targeted agents only worked in the laboratory and not so much in patients. But over the last 10 years, not just in kidney cancer, but in a lot of other cancers, these drugs have become a, a mainstay of therapy and it's, it's very likely that in the future the classic chemotherapy will more or less disappear completely. So what is angiogenesis? If you look at this, if a tumor cell starts, if a normal cell transforms into a tumor cell, um, at, at the beginning these small cells are completely independent from oxygen and nutrition supply. But as they grow, at some point, they need to be supported uh, they need nutrients, they need oxygen, and that's where the formation of blood vessels comes in because the blood is the transport mechanism in your, in your body for all these things. 
And these tumor cells are very smart. They send out messages towards nearby blood vessels to, uh, to grow new blood vessels towards them. And that process is called angiogenesis. And when the tumor, as the tumor starts to grow, there are more and more blood vessels. Um, and, and that makes it a very interesting target because if you are able to shut that process down, then theoretically the tumor cell should not be able to continue to grow. And this is just a quick uh, picture. You see how normally blood vessels should look like and how they look in a tumor. It's a very uncontrolled process. Um, and that is what we target with all these drugs we have currently available. Talked about that. <clears throat> so what drugs do we have in kidney cancer right now in Canada? We have uh, five drugs approved in Canada. Sunitinib, Sorafenib, Pazorpenib, Temsorolimus, and Everolimus. They, for the most part, are pills. They all target certain targets, as you can see here. They are all associated with the angiogenesis process, and they are more or less all approved for the treatment of metastatic kidney cancer. Almost all of them are pills, which makes it very convenient to give. The treatment is usually chronic. As long as a patient's tumor is under control, as that long we usually treat them. If we stop that treatment, then it is uh, likely that, maybe not immediately, but after a while, that the tumor may start to grow again. The treatment is usually given as an outpatient. Patients, uh, for the most part, have not to be admitted for that. But the treatment needs close surveillance through your care team in order to make sure that you tolerate that, uh, the pills and that potential side effects are taken care of immediately. What do these drugs do? They improve tumor shrinkage the so-called response rate. So they have, uh, in, a, in a number of patients, they can shrink the tumors. They can prolong the interval uh, without tumor growth, the so-called progression-free survival. And of course, they can prolong lifespan, the overall survival. But all of them have side effects. And this is one example, sunitinib or sutent, which was one of the first drugs, or the first drug which was available for uh, the treatment. It's a pill which is given usually for four weeks on and then a two-week break. Um, and this is the pivotal study. About 900 patients participate in that, and we will talk about clinical trials at the end of my talk. And as you can see here, um, with Sutin compared to the old drug interferon, 30% uh, more patients had a tumor shrinkage or the tumor didn't grow. The progression-free survival was more than doubled and the overall survival was substantially improved. So these drugs have made a huge difference for our patients and the way we treat kidney cancer. What are the side effects I've alluded to? And we will hear more about that in a minute, and I just want to briefly mention a number of them. The most common side effects are more tiredness, fatigue, elevated blood pressure, hypertension, a sore mouth, indigestion, diarrhea, skin rash, or painful blisters on the hands and feet. As you can see, they appear in different, uh, in different uh, frequency depending on the drug, um, but for the most part, um, they are quite manageable. You have to remember that side effects, when you read the information of one of those drugs, whether it's a kidney cancer drug or simple aspirin or Tylenol you buy in the pharmacy, if you ever go so far and lease the information, you will read three pages of side effects and they're all terrible. Keep in mind that side effects can happen. They don't have to happen. And the same with these drugs. All, you will get three pages of side effects, but they, they can happen. They don't have to happen. Every patient is different, and we cannot predict side effects. All we know is that if we treat 100 patients with these drugs, so many will have fatigue and so many will have a sore mouth, but we don't know which patients these are. Most of these side effects are very treatable. You have to have a good communication with your doctor and your care team in order to be able to uh, proactively treat those uh, these side effects or even avoid these side effects. There's a number of different medications which can help with these side effects. Um, and uh, there is a lot you as a patient can do to prevent side effects. What do we do from the doctor's side if we have side effects we cannot otherwise manage? Well, we can interrupt the dose. We can stop the treatment for a certain period of time. 
We can reduce the dose, something which you don't like to do, but sometimes it's necessary. We can change your schedule. For example, instead of giving you the drug for four weeks on, two weeks off, we can give it for two weeks on, one week off if we think that that is better tolerated. Or we can switch to a different drug. So what do we do usually in first-line treatment? So when a patient has not received any treatment for metastatic kidney cancer, then what do we do in first-line treatment? Currently in BC, we have three drugs we can choose from, sunitinib, pazopinib, and sorafenib. And they are very similar drugs. Um, there are mild differences with regards to the side effect profile uh, and with regards to um, efficacy. And the choice really depends on coexisting illnesses, a lot on the experience of the treating physician, how much experience the physician has with each of these drugs, the functional status of the patient, and what we mean with that is how active a patient is, how much the patient can do his daily activities, the age of the patient, and so on. But of course, ideally, we would have some kind of factor which would tell us which patient benefits most from, for example, sunitinib, and which patient benefits most from pazopinib. So something we can measure or see in the patient um, which, or in the tumor which would tell us this patient should have drug number A or this patient should have drug number B. Those are called predictive factors. So ideally, we would like to have these factors to determine our treatment because we know that the, the group of kidney cancer patients is a very heterogeneous group and some patients benefit from drug A more than from drug B uh, and so on. Unfortunately, despite a huge amount of research going on in that field, um, we don't really have any of these factors identified yet. So if a patient comes in, we cannot say, well, the best would be sunitinib or the best would be pazopinib, because we don't have these factors yet. Interestingly enough, what we do know is that those patients who develop side effects appear to have a better chance to respond to these treatments than patients who don't. And that has been demonstrated for almost any side effect uh, which has ever been uh, looked at. Now, why is that so? And we think that simply the onset of side effect is a sign that the patient had the right amount of dose on board. So it's the onset of side effects as an indicator for an effective dose, the dose which actually causes effects in the patient and in the tumor. And there have been recent data where um, investigators have uh, increased the dose in patients who didn't have side effects and they could demonstrate that that indeed increased the efficacy of the drugs. So that is something which is um, currently very uh, closely under observation. Now unfortunately, despite the success of these drugs, at some point the tumors uh, uh, escape our control and start to grow again. And the most common mechanism is what we call the evasive resistance. So you have a tumor here uh, which initially responds to, uh, to the drug and the tumor gets smaller and after a certain period of time the tumors start to grow again and you know that your drug is now no longer working um, and some other mechanism in the tumor is apparently driving the tumor growth. So what do we do when the initial treatment fails? Well we can switch the treatment, we could increase the dose or we could add another drug. So what does that look like? For, um, for BC, as I mentioned, we have sunitinib, pazopinib uh, uh, approved for first-line treatment. We also have temsorolimus approved for first-line treatment, but that is only a drug for a small group of patients. And then we have uh, a drug called everolimus, which is uh, approved for second-line treatment. And there's another drug called axitinib, which is currently going through the review process and hopefully will be approved in the very near future as an alternative to everolimus. So can patients have these drugs one after the other and does that make sense? Yes, it does. If, if we see that the first-line treatment doesn't work anymore, we usually switch to a second-line treatment. And in, right now, the standard treatment would be Everolimus. Um, and we hope that we will have Axitinib as an alternative in the very near future. These drugs mostly stabilize the disease. Um, um, Axitinib also has the ability to shrink the disease in a certain number of patients and they keep the patient free from progression, free from tumor growth for a prolonged period of time. Can we increase the dose? Yes, 
in a selected group of patients we can because we have learned over the last years that the dose we, uh, uh, we give administer to the patient actually matters. In simple words, the more dose you give, the higher the chance that a patient responds and the tumor shrinks. Now, you can't do that unlimited because of the side effects, but sometimes you can increase the dose and achieve a response again. That is something which, uh, which we previously learned from classic chemotherapy. If you give a higher dose, the chances of responding is higher, and it has now become clear that with these targeted agents, the same principle applies. And that is also the reason why we are usually reluctant to decrease the dose and why we often um, uh, prefer to give a patient a treatment break or change the schedule rather than decrease the dose. Of course, if it's absolutely necessary, then we can decrease the dose. Can we combine these drugs? The, the reason for, um, or the rationale behind combining drugs is very simple. We have learned in, in, in the last 50 years that if you have an active drug A and an active drug B, simple as we are, you put those two together and you get a better result. Um, that applies to almost any of the old chemotherapy agents. Um, drug A plus drug B results in increased efficacy. Unfortunately, for the targeted agents we have currently available, that doesn't seem to work. The most important reason for that is that all of these drugs have very similar side effects, and unfortunately, if you put a drug A with certain side effects together with a drug B with the same side effects, then you get, get a, uh, a multiplying of the side effects, and patients are no longer able to tolerate that. And the few combinations which are tolerable, unfortunately, have not, uh, have not found to be particularly better than either of the drug alone. So right now we do not combine drugs. So now we've talked about first line treatment, second line treatment. So what are we going to do when a patient's, when the second line treatment doesn't work anymore? And that is really currently a, uh, a field of urgent medical need. There is no approved drug for the third line treatment of patients with kidney cancer. We usually sequence these drugs and if drugs are available, then we can use one of the approved drugs as a third-line treatment and see whether that works again. Um, currently in BC, we cannot do that. Um, we, can, we can use two lines of therapy, but then there is no official public funding for any further line of therapy, despite the availability of other, other drugs. And the, the two main reasons are, number one, because there is not really any data from large trials supporting that, uh, despite the fact we think it works. Um, and the, the second reason is that these drugs are extremely expensive with monthly costs of about $6,000. So what do we do? Well, some patients have private insurance and we can convince the insurance company to pay for it. We use access programs and then we often use clinical trials to provide patients with additional options. The cost for these drugs has been a very big debate ever since they were um, introduced into the market. And, uh, and uh, the cost is really a big problem, uh, in particular since in other tumor types where we have much more patients, such as breast cancer or prostate cancer, these drugs are now used as well. And you can, you can imagine with a price tag of around $5,000 a month that, uh, that the costs are really exorbitant for, for these drugs. That is not a new problem. Um, previously, previous, uh, in previous time, in, 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 in previously, other people have already um, recognized that uh, that uh, the costs are really a, uh, an obstacle in getting the optimal treatment. Although we don't treat our patients with wine anymore. And I just want to mention that briefly because um, in 2007 when these drugs were introduced, there was a huge debate uh, in the newspapers and, uh, and uh, on various levels um, how we are supposed to pay for all these things. Um, there's a lot more money spent elsewhere. Um, and it's really at the end of the day, we as a society have to decide how we want to spend the money we have. And, uh, and uh, it is a very difficult topic, but I think we will probably be faced with that debate in the not too distant future because the healthcare costs, with one of the reasons being the extraordinary uh, drug costs, is really getting to a point where we have to start these discussions. I talked briefly about clinical trials and at the end of my talk I would really uh, put that out there. 
Um, what are clinical trials? Well, clinical trials is where we test new drugs. It involves patients who are healthy volunteers, in our world usually patients. We test new treatments to determine whether they are safe, efficacious, and whether they are better than what we have uh, as standard treatment. These studies are usually uh, very tightly controlled. Um, they have a very specific question and they follow a very structured process. It's important for patients to know that a trial may, not, may or may not benefit him as an individual patient. But we wouldn't be where we are today, in particular in kidney cancer, if there hadn't been a lot of patients who participated in the trial. And for the most part, if a doctor, if your doctor offers you a clinical trial, then he does that not necessarily in mind with, we have to answer that research question, but with the, the the fact in mind that he wants to offer you an additional treatment options. Often these trials are excellent vehicles to get access to drugs which you otherwise would not have five minutes, which you otherwise would not have access to. Am I already in overtime? No, I'm good? I will make that. So don't be afraid um, if, if your doctor talks about clinical trials. Um, uh, it's an important tool for us to offer you as patients better access to drugs and access to new drugs. Just to give an example, sunitinib was officially approved and funded in BC in 2007, and we started to treat patients with sunitinib in 2005, two years prior to, uh, to the official launching of sunitinib in BC because we participated in various trials where we could patients put on and these patients could enjoy the benefits of sunitinib two years prior to its official funding. So you should actively ask your oncologist whether there are any trials for you um, because the kidney cancer research world is extremely active and there's a number of trials out there with, uh, which look at very, very interesting drugs which Dr. So will probably talk about after my talk. There is, of course, the more you know about a disease and about the, the way we treat, the more questions we have. Do patients always require therapy immediately? We've addressed that. Observation is an important treatment principle for our selected patients. How long would patients typically stay on these treatments? As I mentioned, usually the treatment is as a chronic treatment, an ongoing treatment. Can patients take the new treatment and work, travel, and carry on with life in general? For the most part, yes, but these drugs have side effects. And depending on the side effects of the patients, the patients will be able to do more or less. I have patients who continue to work full time, and I have patients who cannot do that. Are there any restrictions in terms of exercise and diet? No, they're usually not. But you have to talk to your doctor about, um, about other medications uh, you take because these drugs can have what we call drug-drug interactions uh, where one drug influences uh, the metabolism of the other drug and we have to be careful that we don't uh, fall into a trap there. Can, I, can patients stop the drug if the tumor is, um, is well controlled? That is a question which comes up um, uh, repeatedly. And for a long time, we were very afraid to stop the drug uh, or to give a patient a longer treatment break for two reasons. Number one, we feared that the tumor may, um, may explos explosively grow, uh, and we, were f we feared that the tumor may come back uh, and, uh, after a certain time and start growing again. There is not much known about that situation, but what seems to emerge right now is that, um, that uh, uh, we can stop these drugs without risking that the tumor viciously starts to grow. And despite the fact that a significant number of patients will have tumor progression after a while, uh, it seems that for some patients that treatment-free interval can be quite a long time. And what's most important for both of us, the patient and the doctors, is that when we restart patients on the drug, that the drugs seem to work again. That was one of the major um, uh, concerns that if we stop treatment and then the tumor starts growing, the tumor may not respond to these drugs again, but that does not seem to be the case. So um, um, we have started now for patients who have very well controlled tumor to discuss whether we should give these patients a break or not. So when I summarize 
what, is, what are the most important contributing factors to successful treatment for patients with metastatic kidney cancer? Well, number one, we need to have the right drug and the right dose. We need to be able to keep the patient on the drug as long as the patient benefits, and that means that we have to have very effective side effect management for two reasons, A, to keep the patient on treatment, and B, to ensure that the patient has a good quality of life, and that will be addressed in subsequent talks. What's next with these drugs? As I mentioned, there is a huge amount of research ongoing. There are multiple clinical studies with, uh, with drugs. Um, there are uh, multiple, uh, there's a lot of research going on in the laboratory to find out more about kidney cancer and its behavior. And uh, uh, I'm absolutely certain that kidney cancer will remain a very active field for the years to come. And what holds the future for you as a patient? Um, I, think, um, I think a lot. There is an incredible amount of new drugs currently in development, uh, a lot of them which look very promising and which we hopefully be able to introduce into our daily practice in the not too distant future. And with, with these drugs, we really hope that we can continue to improve the outcome for kidney cancer patients in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>